Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Scream 2, released in 1997. With the first Scream a runaway hit, Dimension Films was eager for a sequel. Luckily, screenwriter Kevin Williamson already had an outline for one. As a horror fan, he knew sequels were common, even if they had a reputation of being bad. With most of the script developed before the first film had left theaters, Scream 2 quickly entered production and was released less than a year after the original. Scream 2 follows Sydney into college, where she targeted by a copycat ghost face. With an extra 10 million bucks for the budget, the sequel features big name stars and even bigger set pieces. Every actress in town wanted to come into this, <laughs> the second part of this series. The crew was equally eager to return, from the casting director down to the prop master. Cast and crew frequently called the set a family, led by their returning director daddy, Wes Craven. Production was rushed though, and faced constant rewrites on the fly. Look at all these script versions, jeez. Some were done without Williamson, since he was busy show running Dawson's Creek. These stressful on-set revisions were made because the original script leaked onto the internet. That pissed off Craven so bad, he sounded like me getting annoyed during a live stream. All of you little fuckers out there that think that's really cute, you fucking ruined our next three months. Despite the messy script caused by all the shifting plot points, there are a lot of fans who call Scream 2 their favorite Scream. I'm the opposite. It's probably my least favorite of the series. But thankfully, there ain't no such thing as a bad Scream. Scream 2 just feels the most drawn out to me, and the most repetitive when compared to the first one. Which, yes, I know is partly the point, but after a while, it starts to feel like when they did another trench run in Force Awakens. It also has some specific scenes that bother me. I, I can't let them go. But the movie's strengths are hella strong, like a lot of its new or promoted characters. It also introduces Stab, the fictional movie within a movie that allowed Williamson to get extra sequel-sized meta. The Stab movies become a runner in Scream, which is great. We wind up with a franchise within a franchise. Best of all, though, is the evolution of the three main characters, and the individual relationships between each of them. Sidney Prescott, in particular, continues to make a case for my favorite character in all of horror. Here, she's the final girl who knows she's living through a sequel, bringing a perfect combination of vulnerability and resolve. Stop treating me like glass, Dewey. I'm not gonna break. Of course, the triad of Her Gal and Dewey only works if everyone excels at their parts, and David Arquette and Courtney Cox continue to find fun folds in their characters. Wes Craven gets a lot of credit for crafting good scares, but he, and the actors, deserve just as much acclaim for these wonderful performances. They really bring an energy to their performances, just like today's sponsor, AG1 from Athletic Greens, brings an energy to my performance. Isn't that right, Fitness James? AG1 is a nutritional drink I have as part of my morning routine, and it really really sets me up for the whole day, with nutrients and phytonutrients to maintain my energy levels and help me perform optimally. What's great is that it's NSF certified, the gold standard for athletes, which I am not in any sense of the word, but hey, still does me good. Now, admittedly, the taste isn't my favorite, but it's mild, and I think worth the benefits. Oh shit, look out, Fitness James! Huh. I guess they just wanted some nutrients too. Support your health journey by clicking the link, where you'll get a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D3K2 and five travel packs with your first purchase. Few sequels surpass the quality of the original, but maybe this one can surpass the quantity of kills. Let's find out and get to them. The movie begins like the first one, with a 90s actress about to watch a scary movie. Since we can't bury more Barrymores, Scream 2 brings in Jada Pinkett as college student Maureen. She and her boyfriend Phil are at the now-closed Rialto Theater in Pasadena, previously seen on the kill count in a dream scene in Nightmare 4. This place is getting Billy Castle up in this bitch. Red right hand place as the crowd goes fucking nuts, like this were a midnight premiere at the Southgate MJR in the mid-2000s. They're here to watch Stab, an in-universe slasher based on the Woodsboro murders in the first film. It's a true story. All these kids got killed a couple years ago in California. But it's not just based on the events of Scream. It's shot like the OG Scream 2. Except this psychosexual shower shot. You get more TNA when you have Heather Graham playing Fakesy Becker. Audiences would have just seen her in Boogie Nights a few months prior. Later, in Scream 4, we'll see Robert Rodriguez credited as Stab's director. But despite a popular misconception, these scenes were still directed by Wes Craven. Phil heads to the bathroom where he can't get a dick in thanks to all the ghost faces. Before he can get a poopin' duet going in the stall, he hears some weird noises next door. 
Is that a little kid voice? What the fuck? In a frankly kind of stupid kill, he puts his ear right up to the nasty ass stall wall, then gets stabbed in the head by a knife strong and long enough to puncture through. Now Phil's cold and he is scared, lying dying on the floor. All thanks to Ghostface, secret knife agent. Dun dun dun. Phil's death might be meta commentary on the whole black character dies first in a horror movie stereotype, but I've got a note, at least in kill count movies, I haven't seen that trope very often. The killer takes Phil's place next to Maureen, who's too scared of Casey's meta-murder to notice the change in screamery. Some shoulder blood finally catches her attention, then a blade catches her on the gut. It's unnoticed by the theater-goers, who are screaming their damn lungs out. God, did someone slip Coke in the Coke? Or the Pepsi. Sorry, they make it mighty clear that it's Pepsi. In any case, this theater is ridiculously over the top, but it's portrayed earnestly enough to keep this horrifying instead of corny. Maureen doesn't die until after she's climbed on stage like someone's got her name in their fucking mouth. The patrons finally realize realize something's wrong when she gives out a banshee scream. Sydney Prescott is now a world-weary college student who has to fend off prank phone calls. It may just be apocryphal, but according to some, the original scream caused a surge in use of caller ID. Hi, did you know that caller ID use tripled after the premiere of Scream? The CBS Sunday Night Movies will be right back. Thanks, Drew. Sydney attends the fictional Windsor College, and while it's never stated in the movie, the screenplay says it's in Ohio. So I'll take that as canon until stated otherwise. Sucks for them. Haha, <laughs> go blue! It's the same school Phil and Maureen attended before they were killed, and the same school Randy Meeks attends, since he followed Sydney there. To no surprise, Randy's a film major, and the conversation his class has makes me cringe out of my skin. It's fine when they start a meta discussion about the merits of sequels. Stab two? Who'd want to do that? Sequels suck. But the specifics of their combo retroactively feel film bro. I got it. The Godfather. Part two. Yeah. It's like, I'm 15 and this is deep. The worst is how supposed film geek Randy gets a classic Aliens quote wrong. Get away from her, you bitch. I believe the line is, stay away from her, you bitch. It's film class, right? <laughs> Get away from her, you bitch. The quote was written correctly in the script, but while filming, the 19-year-old Joshua Jackson mixed up his line and said the right quote accidentally. Jamie Kennedy adapted on the fly and gave the misquote as his line. It bugs the hell out of me. It wasn't messed up the first time they filmed this scene in a lecture hall. Stay away from her, you bitch. That was a great line. One line does not make a movie great. It was reshot later at UCLA, maybe because the first attempt didn't have Sarah Michelle Gellar or Joshua Jackson. Still had awful dialogue, though. I got it, I got it. Friday the 13th, part 20. Geller plays C.C. Cooper, a fellow film student, alongside Mickey Altieri, played by Timothy Olyphant. Sid's friend group also includes her roommate Hallie and her new boyfriend Derek. Randy's not a fan of Derek. Wonder why. Well, maybe you'd stand a better chance if you didn't randomly talk in a British accent, Randy. A lot of shit happens at the movies. People get robbed, shot, maimed, murdered. Multiplex is just a very dangerous place to be these days. No one knows why Jamie Kennedy did that. He just did that in a take. He just did that in a take. The media storm over the movie theater murders prompts the return of Hurricane Gail Weathers. Highlights edition. She's chasing numbers again after writing a successful book about the Woodsboro murders. She has a new cameraman, Joel, whom she berates like he were another Kenny. Her ire even extends to the local press, like reporter Debbie Salt. Begin quote. Great. <laughs> Your flattering remarks are both desperate and obvious. Ouch. End quote. I love the person in the background going, ouch! Ouch! End quote. Ow. Gail tries to score an impromptu exclusive between Sydney and an old, not quite friend, Cotton Weary, her mother Maureen's illicit lover, who was wrongfully imprisoned for her murder. Sydney saw him earlier being interviewed by screenwriter Kevin Williamson in a cameo. The exclusive ends in a familiar way for these ladies. Did you get that old film? Yes, I got that old film! Scream 2 may be the most serious of the franchise, but it still has plenty of funny moments. This one came from actors Elise Neal and Dwayne Martin ad-libbing. When I ad-libbed that, you know, and I was mad at Dwayne that day because he said it right after me trying to steal my shine. And like, oh, are you gonna repeat it? Then they wanted it. So I was like, man, I came up with that. Like, you know, Gal takes a stroll to clear her head and runs into Dewey, who's flown out to keep an eye on Sid. Poor guy's got a limp because of a severed nerve from that stab to the back. He's not keen to rekindle a romance with Gal, since she talked a bit of shit about him in her book. Page 41. 
Deputy Dewey oozed with inexperience. I love the speed bump in their relationship. He's so wounded by her betrayal, and while she doesn't feel bad, she does seem to admire his earnestness. Their chemistry is great, partly because the two actors had started dating in real life, but it's gonna take Gail more than puppy dog eyes to fix Dewey's deeply hurt feelings. Dewey has a much better reunion with Sid, where their sibling-like relationship flourishes. It makes sense, she was his little sister's best friend, and with Tatum gone, Sydney works as a replacement sibling. Our surrogate big brother. <laughs> The scene also introduces Dewey's theme, a musical leitmotif that perfectly suits his character. I sadly don't get to talk about music a lot on The Kill Count, because playing clips with music is an easy way to get copyright claims. Marco Beltrami's work is important to the Scream series, though. The original film was the first feature-length score he composed, and he'd worked with Craven six more times, including on Screams 2, 3, and 4. I love his Morricone-inspired work in Scream, and the haunting choral voices of Sidney's Lament. But Dewey's theme was not one of his pieces. It was originally composed by Hans Zimmer for the 1996 film Broken Arrow. Sidney gets invited to a sorority mixer by a pair of Stepford sister wives, Lois and Murphy. They're played by a pre-arrested development Portia de Rossi and Rebecca Gayhart, who would wind up in the Scream-esque urban legend the next year. Despite Sid's reluctance, Hallie drags her along for a night out with these super friendly sisters. Sidney, you made it! Hi! No, I really mean that. Hi. She really means that. Hi. This party features Everclear and Matthew Lillard in the background. He had dropped by to visit Nev Campbell on set, right before the two briefly dated. Not at the party is Randy's classmate Cece, who's sober sitting the sorority house while her sisters rage. She's played by Buffy herself, Sarah Michelle Geller, who had just finished filming the Williamson penned I Know What You Did Last Summer. It doesn't take long for her to get a threatening phone call. Look, do you want to leave a message for someone? Do you want to die tonight, Cece? Cece CeCe's if someone's outside, but it's just Donnie, a fellow sister played by a young Marisol Nichols. Last seen on the kill count in Spiral getting a steamy facial. Oh, sorry, phrasing. Donnie leaves the door open, letting a ghost face in, so Cece is soon attacked by a killer with cruel intentions. He Scooby-Doo chases her upstairs, getting all sorts of shit thrown at him, including a bike. Ultimately, she gets thrown through a glass door and stabbed in the back. Ghostface then tosses Cece over the balcony, and Daphne goes splatney on the pavement below. News of the murder reaches the mixer, and the partygoers leave to check out the crime scene, including the greatest extra of all time. God, I love that guy. Look at his stupid face. Whoa! The crowd also includes this good boy, whom it looks like Liev Schreiber brought to set and insisted be in the picture. Why can't he just walk down the steps? <laughs> can he hit a mark? He can hit a mark. <laughs> put, a, put a dog biscuit in there. There's a mark. Booty. Can you hit a mark? See that? <laughs> <laughs> he was very excited the dog succeeded. This kind of chaos is old hat for Sid, so she decides to turn in for the night, right after she takes one last phone call. Hello? Hello, Sydney. Remember me? A chase ensues, but Sydney manages to get to the back door unstabbed. Derek dashes inside to confront her assailant, but when Dewey follows suit, all he finds is a bloodied boyfriend. But not too bloodied, making him look mighty suspect in the long dark shadow of Billy Loomis. You're lucky he didn't kill you. Yeah, it's awfully convenient. Gal and Dewey meet with Police Chief Hartley and figure out the connection between the victims. Is Cece the girl's real name? Uh, Casey. Casey Cooper. As in Casey Becker? With Phil Stevens, representing Casey's boyfriend Steve, and Maureen Evans standing in for Sydney's mom Maureen Prescott, the police officially determine they're dealing with a copycat killer. Well, Gail determines it. Give credit where credit is due. Either way, Chief Hartley must be proud, since he's played by David Arquette's real-life father, Louis Arquette. But Gail's investigative charm still haven't won Dewey back over yet. Come on, Dewey. Smile just once. I smile when I catch the killer. Sydney sits down for a quiet lunch, but Derek ain't about to let that happen. And so I just decided to myself, I'd hide it to myself. What is he doing? He's ruining the movie is what he's doing, by breaking out into song to prove his love to Sid. I don't. think I love you. Don't do this. I yeah, man, please don't. It's an acknowledged reference to Top Gun, where Tom Cruise does the same thing with a different song. It's awful in that movie, and it's even worse here. I can't stand it. I hate everything about it. I hate how long it goes on for. I hate Mickey's stupid dance moves. Fuck you all for clapping. It sucks so bad. And stop conducting, dude. It's so cringe. This Partridge Family song had to be sung by Jerry O'Connell during his audition. Personally, I might have just passed on the part. The cast hated doing it as much as I hate watching it. None of us really like that song. 
<laughs> Look at this shit. You can tell O'Connell would rather be hiking towards a dead body. I mean, I did the best I could. <laughs> yeah, you did, when you weren't stepping on the wrong table. At the end of this garbage, Derek gives Sid his fraternity letters, which they say is a frat faux pas. I don't know if that's real or not. It's all Greek to me. With that cafe catastrophe over, we check in with Randy and Dewdrop, who's drinking a milkshake just like he had his little ice cream cone in the original. Dewey the Dairy Fan. The two watch a scene from Stab on TV, where Billy Loomis is played by Luke Wilson. I guess because of Bottle Rocket? I love how they recreate the hilarious end of that scene. They mentioned that in Stab, Dewey's played by David Schwimmer, co-star to Courtney Cox in Friends. As for Sydney, she's played by Tori Spelling, which was mentioned as a potentiality in the first screen. I see you as a young Meg Ryan myself. Thanks, Dewey, with my luck they'd cast Tori Spelling. Randy once again explains the rules of a horror movie, but this time as they specifically pertain to sequels. Number one, the body count is always bigger. Number two, the death scenes are always much more elaborate. More blood, more gore. As always, David Arquette is hilarious in how specific and unique his acting is. Maybe you are a suspect. Well, if I'm a suspect, you're a suspect. Do you have a point? Sydney tries to back out of the leading role in her school's play. I've never loved this Agamemnon subplot, written by Craven during one of the onset rewrites, but I do like the thematic resonance of Sydney playing Cassandra, the oracle whose warnings were always ignored. It also gives us a cameo by the late David Warner as her teacher, last seen on the kill count in the Ice Cream Man. Rest in peace. He doesn't believe in bad omens, so he tells her the show must go on. During rehearsal, Sydney gets screamy once the fake knives start flying and the hooded faces start ghosted. She runs off stage to weep in the wings, where Derek all of a sudden appears. With that killer boyfriend shadow of Billy still loomising over her, Sydney breaks up with Derek. She ain't about to let no second Lion King ruin her pride. Dewey and Randy meet up with Gal and Joel, who's gotten nervous since learning that Kenny was killed. The specifics don't really matter to him. Got it slash the guy ain't in the union no more. He leaves to grab a coffee, and the others get a phone call. I'm not interrupting anything, am I? You three look deep in thought. It sounds like the killer is watching them, so Randy stays on the line while Dewey and Gale assault every student with a cell phone on the dyad. Or, sorry, the quad. Windsor College was played by Agnes Scott, a private women's college in Metro Atlanta. It provided most of the exterior and interior locations. Beautiful campus. Ghostface teases Randy and says he'll always be the geeky supporting character, never the MC. Fuck you! Unfortunately for Randy, the call is coming from inside the news van, and no one hears him struggling over these b-boys blaring Cottonmouth Kings. I listened to an embarrassing amount of Cottonmouth Kings, and was kind of excited to find a music video of theirs on the Scream 2 Blu-ray. By the time Gal and Dewey find him, Randy's become the first legacy character to die. Poor little hot dog got ketchup to death. Yeah, let it out, Gal. Don't relish in it. Sydney gets a threatening instant message in the library, scrambling her security detail, officers Andrews and Rich Richards. Their names are taken after the kid actors in Halloween, Brian Andrews and Kyle Richards. They do a shithouse job, leaving Sid alone so she can get jumped by Cotton Weary. He's eager to step into the spotlight by doing a talk show sit-down with her. We're talking prime time, Sid. You, me, and Diane Sawyer. Understandably, she refuses. Also understandably, Cotton's gotten a little weary of being labeled the bad guy. I mean, come on, Sydney, you drag my name through the mud. Everybody thinks I'm some kind of psycho killer, and all I'm asking for is my little fucking Diane Sawyer interview to maybe get my side of the story straight. He just wants everything illuminated. I love how Cotton Weary was brought back for Scream 2. He was just a throwaway character in the first film and we never thought we'd see Lev again. We lucked out that Liev Schreiber was cast for this single shot of him in Scream 1. All I had to do was to get out of a car and walk up a flight of stairs it was one of the easiest jobs I'd ever done. Cotton's so interesting, an awkward guy who's been profoundly affected by being wrongly accused. I love how he has a decent point here, but is way too aggro explaining it. It gets him arrested, but he's released due to lack of evidence. Sydney doesn't know who to trust anymore, since after all, everybody's a suspect! Except Randy, because he's dead. In fact, his death prompts Joel to be the smartest horror movie character ever. Not wanting to go the way of Kenny, he straight up leaves the movie, which was an idea Dwayne Martin had and pitched to Craven. He goes, how would you leave? I said, cab. <laughs> he said, you want to leave by taxi? I said, yeah. 
He said, all right. And that's exactly what he does. Randy's death also hits Gail like hell, causing her to verbally lick Debbie Salt. Salt's been around seasoning some scenes, and even casting suspicions towards the story-seeking Gail. Well, it just seems to me that if the killer is repeating what happened in Woodsboro, it's quite possible that the killer could be from Woodsboro. But at this point, Gail wants to do the right thing without any regard for ratings. I just want to find this fucker! I really do. That finally wins over Dewey, and the two take Joel's footage to the film school to try to find a ghost face in the grassy knoll. The home movies get them hot and heavy with each other, but they take a break when, hey, they take a break, Dewey, when they realize someone spliced the live feed into the footage they're watching. It ain't Tyler Durden in the projection booth. It's a non-union editing ghost face, motherfucker! In the ensuing awesome chase scene, which is always a highlight of Screams, Dewey ends up in a soundproof booth where he's stabbed in the back once again. Gail watches helplessly, and then Ghostface pulls his classic disappearing act. When Gal runs into a bloodied cotton in the hallway, she's convinced she's found the killer. She even lets Debbie Salt in on the scoop. The killer is cotton fucking weary! Cotton weary? Elsewhere, Derek bids Sydney a farewell as she departs with Hallie to save her shores. He's quickly attacked by hooded figures, but they ain't ghost faces, they Greek faces, here to haze Derek for giving Sydney his frat letters. You know, frat stuff. They have no king but Caesar, crucify him. Yeah, and make his penis shotgun a beer. Heads up, little buddy. When Sydney's police escort stops at a traffic light, Ghostface sucker punches Andrews through the window, then sucker slices his neck open. Splurt. Richards takes a beating, but pops up to play the hero. Then he Ghostface rides the whip when the killer floors the gas. The new hood ornament tries to get a shot off with his gun, but his wild ride ends in hell when his head is impaled on a bunch of pipes. Ooh, baby, that driver's batshit. God, those final death twitches are seriously disturbing. Look at his little hand wiggle. Ugh. The crash knocks Ghostface out, giving Sydney and Hallie the chance to escape the backseat. This suspense sequence wasn't in the script. Craven said they came up with the idea on set. That means Nev Campbell had to do this backbending stunt without any preparation. But she always loved the physical aspect of playing Sydney, and credits her history as a dancer for her athleticism. Sydney nearly unmasks the killer, but has to abort the mission when she slips out a little toot. <laughs> I still think it's dumb she doesn't do it, and she does too after she and Hallie escape down the street. She runs back to fix the mistake, only to find that the fender-bending phantom ain't in the car no more. Instead, he's right behind a clueless Hallie. What? Whom he stabs to death in front of Sydney, then drops her body to the ground. Hallie feels a little under utilized to me, maybe because she was originally supposed to be one of the killers, before the extensive rewrites. Sid makes it back to campus, where a siren song lures her into the theater. On stage, she's jump-scared by a Jesus Christ superstar, Derek, bound and boozy from that hazing session earlier. Before she can untie him, she's stopped by Ghostface, who reveals himself to be... Uh, yeah, Mickey. Surprise, Sydney. I mean, I guess, but mostly because I had forgotten that character existed. Dude literally hasn't been in the movie since 45 minutes ago, when he was waving his arms around like a jackass. Timothy Oliphant tries his best to save this lame reveal, but Mickey's still just a second-rate stew. Surprise, Sydney. Mickey implies that Derek has been his partner in crime all along. The frat bro asks Sydney to stand by him, but she's unable to bring herself to trust him. As she's frozen in hesitation, Mickey plugs a hole straight through Derek's broken heart. Mickey sucks as a reveal, but it is downright evil the way he makes Sid feel guilty for suspecting Derek right up to his death. You should really deal with your trust issues, Sid. He reveals he's got a case of the crazies with a harebrained homicidal scheme to get caught. Then he'll bask in the media frenzy and blame his murder spree on horror movies. Killing people to become famous is a sadly prescient motivation that resonates with earlier dialogue about life imitating art. You can't blame real-life violence on entertainment. Hello, the murderer was wearing a ghost mask, okay? Just like in the movie, it's directly responsible. No, it's not. This commentary also helped Scream 2 with the MPAA. The opening, they felt, was an excellent commentary on the nature of horror movies and that we were being responsible by making that uh, in some way. There's still one elephant in the room though, who might be working with Mickey as a second ghost face. Turns out it's Gail Weathers. <laughs> nah, just kidding. It's crazy-eyed Debbie Salt, whose real name is... Mrs. Loomis? That's right. That lady is... Billy's 
mother! Scream 2 originally had a very different ending, back when it was filmed as Scream the sequel, before Miramax demanded a title change. Mrs. Loomis was always the primary antagonist, but at first she had three accomplices, Derek, Hallie, and Cotton Weary. When that draft got leaked, revisions and secrecy followed. A fake script was written, which was also leaked, scripts were printed in a way to prevent photocopying, and most people's scripts had the last act largely blacked out. Or I remember seeing a lot of blacked out pages in my script. So, I thought I might be wearing one of those. Laurie Metcalf's hunch was right, and the matriarchal murderer was foreshadowed earlier by Randy. Mrs. Voorhees was a terrific serial killer. Like Pamela, Mrs. Loomis wants to avenge her son's death, so she plans on killing Sidney and enlisted Mickey online to help her. As for Mickey's plan, she knows it's dumb as shit, so she turns on him and shoots the loose end. The psycho cinephile lets off a shot that hits Gail in the tum tum. She stage dives into the theater pit for pretty much the rest of the movie. Unlike Mickey, Mrs. Loomis is a great ghost face reveal, especially because Laurie Metcalf plays her as delightfully unhinged. I am sick to death of people saying that it's all the parents' fault. It all starts with the family. You want to blame someone, why don't you blame your mother? Sidney manages to break away with a breakaway bottle before fighting firepower with fake fire. God, this part is dumb as hell too! What kind of antagonist gets defeated by college drama department props? What are you doing, Sid? Trying to scare her away with noise? She ain't a bear! Their struggle is interrupted by a straight gunshot from Cotton, whom Sidney quickly catches up and introduces to Crazy Eyes Deb. Mrs. Loomis tries to convince Cotton to let Sidney die, but he's gonna base his actions on how they best benefit him. Bet you that Diane Sawyer interview's looking real good right about now. Since Sidney would take Diane over Diane, she accepts the offer. Cotton shoots the homicidal housewife, ensuring that Lady Bird will grow up an orphan. Sidney grabs the gun and gets jump scared by Gal, who says the bullet just bounced off her ribs. Well then, nice of you to help back there, Gal! Since this ain't these ladies' first rodeo, they're suspicious of Lori Metcalf's death face. I always come back. But it's the Deadwood that ain't so dead. Mickey's still got some kicky in him. They quickly gun him down, sending his body tumbling upstage. Or is it downstage? I, I can never remember. It was a justified shooting though, so Sydney has nothing to worry about. I, that one was closer to a cause for concern. Hope Sid gets some therapy after this. The paramedics arrive alongside Joel, who comes back to cover the night's events. Gail can't be bothered though, after spotting Dewey doing the same old back jab Jesus routine he did in the original. Instead of filing a report, Gail picks her heart over her job and rides off with the deucester in the ambulance. Sydney is swarmed by reporters, but she directs them to Cotton Weary instead, calling him a hero and giving him the 15 minutes of fame he's been craving. The movie ends with some 90s post grunge as Sydney walks away to, wait, where is she going? Literally all her college friends are dead. How many co-eds received a deadly degree at sequel school? Well, I want to tell you, but this morning I woke up with this feeling I, I didn't know how to deal with. And so I just decided to myself, I'd hide it to myself and never talk about it. And didn't I go and shout it when you asked for a rock kill count? Let's get to the numbers! Let's get to the numbers! Let's get to the numbers! Isn't that what the show was based on? Though it's much more nowadays, I still always gotta say, let's get to the numbers! Ten people died in Scream 2, with the victims six men and four women, giving us these sequel slices of pie. Sure enough, Randy was right. The second installment had more kills than the first. Three more. With a runtime of 120 minutes, that gave us a kill on average every 12 minutes flat. I'll give the Golden Chainsaw for coolest kill to Officer Richards. It's easily the goriest death in the movie, and the post-death twitching is the cherry on top. Don't machete for lamest kill will go to Hallie, since it's a basic slice and dice with an exceptionally dumb buildup. What? You you heard me! And that's it. Scream 2 was released in 1997. The original trilogy would be capped off with Scream 3 in 2000, which I'll look at next week. But until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this Kill Count recount on Scream 2. It's good to be back in the swing of film and kill counts. I missed them, even though these are recounts. They're still just as good as new ones. It's all new information, people. You think this is the same video as like the seven minute thing I uploaded in 2017? No. No, it's not. Thank you, Zorin, for driving over to our house just to be in that to the numbers bit. I mean, I guess I'm paying him to do it, but still, it was nice of him to come. Is Scream 2 your favorite sequel? Like, it might have my favorite dynamics between the main cast, but everything 
everything else just weighs it down just below the level of the other movies. I know I used to hate Scream 3, but you'll see next week, I love that movie now. I want to thank some patrons like Ari Koo, Jeff Lowe, Brandon Logan, Tyler Brom, Thebo, Skeptic Mantis, and Ryan Moore. Thanks everyone. Be good people.